Sylvie's stories and poems have appeared in Peregrine Journal, Epiphany, Cleaver Magazine, and December Magazine, among others. One of her short stories was nominated for the 2017 Penn slash Robert J. Dow Short Story Prize for Emerging Writers and received a Pushcart Special Mention. She's the co-founder of Kajibi, a print and online literary magazine. Sylvie, thank you. Top rules for successful earthbound ethnographic fieldwork. One, make yourself invisible. Be friendly, but stay nebulous. Don't babble away. Do not shine. If you shine, you will attract attention. This isn't about you. Two, first, thoroughly learn the native's language, behavior, and ways of thinking so as to be able to pass as a native. Three, do not, however, forget that you are not a native. You are to engage in participant observation. You will participate physically and emotionally in the social daily lives of the natives as a guest member. The goal is to reduce cultural distance with the natives and to be able to act as one of them without disrupting their behavior. Four, choose your native informants carefully. Informers must be knowledgeable about their own culture, but also able and willing to communicate this knowledge in an open and free manner. You will find that sapiens self-awareness varies greatly. Try to locate outsiders or unconventional, less conventional members. A few bright informants will shed more light on a culture than a thousand dim natives. Five. While this place is very small, once you have entered your field, you might feel as if your research is boundless. Don't get sidetracked. Remember your hypothesis. Why do sapiens believe what they call love is essential to their survival as a species? Keep in mind the larger theoretical purpose of your mission. The planet is being destroyed by overpopulation and the possibility of extraterrestrial colonization by those crazy natives is real. Stay focused. Six, beware of gravity. Never underestimate this powerful, inescapable terrestrial phenomenon by which any mass or energy bodies are drawn towards each other. Keep your distance from your informants, even in intimate encounters. Seven, beware of stardust. The sapiens capacity for rationalization and self-deception is far more advanced than first appears. Eight, it goes without saying that you must avoid black holes at all costs. Remember that light renders them invisible. Entire stars, once as luminous as you are, have been extinguished after passing the point of no return. Think of all the stars that came before you, now dead. Don't be like them. Nine, in the instance that you feel pulled down by gravity and universe forbid, since you're about to fall into a black hole, please reach out to us right away. We will retrieve you immediately. Godspeed, Myra, your open cluster advising committee. The beginning of fieldwork. Imagine yourself surrounded by a large group of natives behaving in ways that are completely unfamiliar to you. There are dozens of them standing around and mingling in a cheerful manner, casually and joyfully chatting with one another, extending hands, cheeks, warmly embracing regardless of sex, body type, or age. These particular sapiens all seem excessively happy to be together. This is the first native ceremonial ritual you have been invited to. It marks the end of your extensive training and the beginning of your field work. It involves a large group of the natives you have been sent to study, all of them related in one way or the other by at least some loose kinship ties. The natives are dressed up in ways that appear significant, do not say ritualistic. All male natives wear identical costumes, 
a black pen, tuxedo jacket, white shirt, black bow tie. Their shoes are also black and as shiny as obsidian rocks. Their facial and cranial hair are styled in various but careful fashion. These males appear to have groomed themselves in ways you have rarely encountered during your training. The female sapiens garbs are far more elaborated and varied. All females, with no exceptions, are wearing a sleeveless dress that reaches below the knee. Colors from the entire spectrum are represented, except for pure white or bright red. They wear high heeled shoes that reveal most of the foot and extend their natural height by several inches. If legs are bare, the skin showing is hairless and smooth. Jewelry of various size and metal adorn wrists and fingers and hang dramatically from necks and earlobes. As for their cranial hair, it is evident that these female sapiens have spent even more time grooming it than their male counterpart. Naturally frizzy hair has been tamed through extended blowing heat and the use of polyvinyl acetate, known more commonly as hairspray. Conversely, flat hair has been given volume through a different thermal and chemical process producing curls that seem to defy gravity. It is June, the beginning of summer in this particular hemisphere and today, the elaborate ritual that is taking place is called a wedding ceremony. The sun is high, the grass green, the skies from this terrestrial perspective blue, always so blue. As is expected, each of the guests is accompanied by what the natives amusingly call a plus one, by which they mean husband, wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, dates, or potential mates. Each guest is allowed, if not in fact required, to bring along. While the wedding is one of the few sapiens rituals that appears to be universal across time and culture, its shape and form varies greatly geographically. And while the expectations that such union will last here in this particular field, you know that it is more likely than not that the union will not last. Yet the amount of money and resource utilized and spent, you also know is astronomical. The waste, of which you try to not be judgmental, will be unavoidable and its excess can perhaps be measured. It strikes you right then by this simple formula. Energy and resource invested divided by the years of the union plus the number of offsprings equal planetary cost. After writing this down in a cocktail napkins, you carefully fold you realize with alarm that you've left your purse at a side table and that your dress has no pockets. You awkwardly tuck the napkin into your bra. You continue to look around while practicing that fixed half smile most female sapiens around you seem to sport so easily while in the presence of others. Like all the other guests, you are now standing while holding a coupe glass filled with the bubbly liquid resulting from a combination of fermented grapes and carbon dioxide, a costly and highly value uh, beverage often served at such native celebratory ceremonies. You take a sip and enjoy it very much, but remind yourself that past experience with fermented beverage during your fieldwork training have shown to affect your objectivity and observation skills. Still, you can't resist taking just another small sip and you let the sparking bubbles linger into your mouth until they disappear. And all you have left is a warm, bubbleless, slightly bitter liquid now undistinguishable from your own saliva. As you do so, you notice that a male sapiens in his 40s is staring at you. You swallow the liquid. The shape of his body reminds you of an old fashioned spinning top, the shape of his hair, a head of broccoli. He's also wearing an oddly shaped pair of spectacles, not unlike the ones you were forced to wear by your guest mother during your early training. Now it appears that the male sapiens might be smiling at you. Not wanting to be distracted, you turn your back to him just in time to observe the celebrated couple walking under the elaborately decorated trellis at the entrance of the garden. 
you quickly make notes of a few obvious facts. It appears that the female sapiens, who is called the bride, is much, much, much younger than the male sapiens, who is called the groom. You will soon learn that the groom has been married before twice and that the offspring of these two previous unions are present. In fact, it appears that these grown children and the bride are approximately of the same age. The bride is also visibly pregnant. You make a note to yourself that the prior existence of offspring must be dismissed as a possible restraint on sapiens reproduction, at least for its senior male members. Round tables of various size have been set up across the lawn into a precise constellation across the garden, with the smaller ones orbiting around the largest central tables like moons vying for the sun's warmth. Each table is decorated in a very intricate manner. In front of each seat, you notice a delicate paper bag, the content of which remains mysterious, and a folded card on which the name of each guest has been handwritten. It is obvious that elaborate kinship rules govern these seating arrangements. You finally notice that you are the only guest about the age of 18 who isn't accompanied, your plus one being your mission, which is to observe, research, and report. The dress you bought for the occasion and have never worn before feels both restraining and too revealing. The shoes you wear have the lowest heels you could find, much lower than those worn by the female surrounding you, and yet you fear the forward pull of gravity with every step you take on the manicured lawn. While you have been trained for this or being singular among the natives, you also realize for the first time that the long preparation you have undergo, 20 years spent as an earthling in your guest family, may have also made you so familiar with natives' ways that you aren't completely immune to the pull of gravity that tugs slightly at the organ that pumps your blood. You take another sip of the tasty bubbly beverage. Then along with everyone else, you take your seat. Because of your lack of a plus one, you have been assigned a seat at a table positioned in the wider orbital range of the ceremony nucleus. The table sits 12 natives, half of them being on the age, underage sapiens, intermingled with a random assortment of three older females and two older male guests. The spinning top body broccoli head male sapiens noted above is one among them. As you already know from your extensive training, little sapiens are as adorable as they are needy and distracting. Indeed, you already have your own half-form hypothesis, not yet shared with your advisors. That is exactly because of this double quality of appealing cuteness and engulfing neediness that children, while of no fault of their own, have been used from the beginning of time as justifiable reasons to destroy the planet. But here you are again, getting distracted. You, relax, you reluctantly put your hand over your coop when a waiter offers you more bubbly liquid. Rule number five pops into your head, stay focused. Observing the guests at the other tables by discreetly leaning on one buttock and then the other, you listen carefully and try to figure out the various kinship ties that link each guest each guest with the couple and what they say about the event. What amazes you is this, here they all are assembled on this particular day in this particular place at great financial cost, both to themselves, to the newlywed and their families and to the planet to publicly celebrate and recognize the couple as mating companions and potential breeding partners now legally bound because of this assumed reproductive activity. Of the possible economic interests, inevitable peer pressure or unconsciously internalized social norms as possible motivation, nothing is said. Instead, the focus is firmly on what the natives call love. This elusive, ill-defined, unseen dark matter undetectable by any astronomical instruments, much hypothesized and rasped about 
in all sapient cultures. Love, believed to be abundant, universal, essential to the survival of sapiens as a species. And yet, the cause of this continuing excessive reproduction, most likely to bring about its own self-destruction. Are you Myra by any chance? I've heard so much about you. You nod to the spining top broccoli hair male sapiens who is addressing you from across the table. Yes, you answer. My name is Myra. Can I ask you a few questions? Thank you. Okay, it's my pleasure now to introduce our next reader, Sean Sutherland. Uh, Sean has had poems published in the literary magazines, Limehawk, Gravel, Prick of the Spindle, Blast Furnace, Hypertext, another literary magazine, along with the anthology, The Writer's Studio at 30, and the main review with honorable mention for their poetry prize in 2015. He was <clears throat> nominated for a push card by the literary magazine Sleet in 2019. Sean is a McDowell Colony Fellow. He is currently studying with Philip Schultz in his master class at the Writer's Studio. Sean, take it away. That was wonderful. Beware of stardust, that's gonna stay in my head. Uh, so I've got three poems I'm gonna read for you tonight. Um, the first one, I think all you really need to know before I read it is that uh, the voice in the poem is addressing the celebrated American uh, poet, James Wright. Um, and then this is also based on a visit that I took to his hometown a couple of summers ago uh, of Martins Ferry, Ohio. To James Wright is the title. I drive four states to visit the Martins Ferry you gave me. The one I've always thought of as a kind of wellspring of tenderness. Just past where you swam at the bend of the Ohio River both banks slope down to overlap like the arms of a schoolboy asleep on his desk. Here, you grew up among those who had no voice. Up on the hill, silvered tree trunks lean with gravestones and unmowed grass. I recall doggero types of Civil War battlefields. A pink tricycle on the lawn Someone's mother and someone's grandmother, both smoking cigarettes, pull out of their driveway in a Toyota with the back window taped over with a garbage bag. I ask if they can tell me where your old high school was. Oh, honey, that's long gone, they answer, in a cadence that sounds like it's from an old Carter family song about what never returns. I make a pledge to remember their harmony before I thank them. But I do not want to go back the way I came. My sadness is the near enemy of compassion. The scornful eyes of the young truck driver watch me from the rear view mirror of his 16 wheeler, where we are both surrounded by anonymous steel sheds, keep out signs and empty lots on the only strip of road that separates your people from the river, where I take what is not permitted, a swim in the purifying and ruined waters of the Ohio. This next poem is called A Sunday in Los Angeles for Stephen Amato. <clears throat> After a long sickness, or months paused on those last words of a friend's before they were gone, was there a day you returned unexpected as bougainvillea, red as a pinprick drop of your own blood? My friends, two shepherds, look up to ask, where are we going? They nose through the thin strip of grass 
along the sidewalk, as fervent for new smells as I am. Nobody is on the street or on their lawn. For years, I have taken these two for walks past the same white Spanish style mansion where we often hear a fragment of notes from the same someone practicing the French horn, an instrument known to signal the beginning of marriages, kings, or simply the day, a silvery lit comet streaking over the bright morning. A quick burst of scales, we stop, silence. Then in the absence of notes, a longing continues, resurfaces and shimmers there. The dogs and I lift our heads and look towards as one might wait on someone's unfinished sentence. Suddenly, the first passionate long notes begin. And I remember as we walk each other up into the morning, what is limitless can begin in the pale blue sky above the San Gabriel Mountains. The last poem I'm gonna read is, um, I think two things would be helpful to, to know before I start. Um, so this poem is uh, centered in the world of what is called factory trawlers. So there are large uh, commercial fishing vessels that not only catch fish, but uh, they also process the fish on board in factories down below the deck. Uh, and then there are two uh, veiled allusions to something that's called joint venture. So joint venture uh, refers to the practice of different countries, including the United States, that allow other countries to fish within inside their 200 mile limit um, for either a, a financial compensation or a percentage of the catch. So this, this poem is called 1989. <clears throat> Two men have just jumped off a Polish national factory fishing trawler. It is 1986. The US Coast Guard cutter is not far, it would seem. The one in front with cupped hands white as house paint, pulls hard against the dark Pacific, three miles from Coos Bay, Oregon. The one behind won't put his head down, beats back the water as though he's being robbed. They reach something the papers will say is their freedom. What if I had to commit my body to an act so urgent? Would it make me more grateful for everything yet to come? How to know. Yet today, one yellowed page of notebook paper, folded, soft from age, flutters down from a book I had forgotten. Written at the top far left is the word Polish in the hand of Merrick, the good swimmer. Opposite is the word English in mine. I hear Bruno, the one who flailed, call the sea a bitch. I am back in a bunk room on a Norwegian factory trawler. I welcome these two with four other poles on board. It is 1989. We are in our 20s. All of us have come from other trawlers. We're after stories, jokes that can't hurdle a cultural divide, which makes them funnier, or want landscapes described to us so we can imagine them as our own. Although nobody asks him if he has a love of his own fate, Merrick declares, I have Trans Am, can see heavy metal bands I like, get one month off a year. I listen, the one who has read On the Road one too many times. But if asked by his Polish friend why he is here, that 25 year old would first look confused, mutter something about the sea, or that he wanted to escape the predictable, which ends tomorrow when we will work 16 hour days for six months with an exhaustion that can make our hair hurt. In this room, there is only one thing. You can hear it better if you didn't know what you would do if you smelled cut grass, weren't able to watch the seasons change, or not know whether it's day or night for days because you stand six feet below the surface in a white noise of scissoring filet machines and always two inches of cold seawater on the factory floor. 
It's there behind the words of one young Pole who points a finger at me, excited, and asks, what do you like to do? Not what do you like to do on a Saturday night or more than anything, just what do you like to do? Then someone asks on behalf of another, can I help him with his English? Then they all ask, and we agree to teach each other our language. What is here is deprivation, or call it a hunger for everything. In the one porthole, a heavy snow falls fast in the yellow light of the dock's only street lamp. And beyond that dark, it is easy for me to believe endless illusions and the world have slunk off and are no longer there, except on this paper I hold. Someone is tearing out of a notebook. We begin to put it back one word at a time. Not one of us brings their cigarette to their lips or draws from the bottle of lukewarm vodka. Each suggestion is said like a question. Man, one asks, then another woman, then child. And as we go around, a strange freedom takes hold. Then factory, knife, water, fish, our days, then time, song, home, in which you can hear great distances pull the silence taut around them. And I am overwhelmed by the cherishing for these words, how each asks me to say their name once more, once desired again, they become the thing itself. I am uh, <clears throat> happy to introduce our next reader, Jennifer Dalvia. Jennifer Dalvia's fiction has been published in 34th Parallel, Epiphany, Hanging Loose, and the Rapanic Review. And a new story is forthcoming in Chautauqua. She has been nominated for Pushcart Prize and named as a finalist in Glimmer Train Short Story Award for new writers. Please welcome Jennifer. Um, now I'm going to read the beginning of a story called The Same Old Mom. One day, when you're sitting at your desk, working on your doctoral thesis in linguistics, your mother calls, and she's hysterical, crying and panting, and hardly understand her. I don't know who I am, she wails. You're more annoyed than worried. The truth is, your mother can get a bit overwrought, and when that happens, she leans on you, more than a mother should, you think. You're my mom, you tell her hoping that'll ground her and also remind her of her role in the relationship. She's probably just going through some menopause or something. So all of this is pretty crazy, which automatically makes you crazy. She doesn't say anything and your eyes wander to your shelves and find a book on universal grammar, a seminal theory that explains how each part of speech has its own place. Nouns can't take the place of verbs it's something that seems obvious, but is somehow revolutionary when you map it out. An adjective is an adjective and it acts like one. A verb always acts verby. Everything behaves just as it's supposed to. Isn't that comforting? And you wish your mother would do that too. You could create a semantic map, almost like a family tree, mother with two lines fanning out to daughter and son, except that your mother is in the daughter slot acting daughtery and where exactly does that leave you? Okay, mom, you say, I'll be there this weekend. I'll drive up on Saturday. Usually your mother is ecstatic when you say you're coming. Usually she offers to pay for the rental car. You wait, but she says nothing. Could this be a serious thing after all? Early onset Alzheimer's, mental illness? In any case, you're at the end of the conversation because apparently your mother's neighbor, Mr. Richard, is at her door and he needs her. Coming, you hear her call out before she hangs up. 
well, apparently she can pull herself together for Mr. Richard, but not for you. On the other hand, if your mom can snap out of it that quickly, she's probably not demented. This is not the first time your mother has acted bizarrely. Once when you were a teenager and your parents were totally broke, she came home euphoric with 20 pairs of shoes, unwrapping each pump from its tissue paper cocoon to show you. They were different colors and she tried them all on laughing guiltily and happily. After that, she never wore any of those shoes, not even once. They stayed in their boxes in the back of the closet for years. So maybe the phone call was like that. Maybe your mom was having a moment that would soon be put back in her box, in its box. But then again, maybe not. Your mom has gotten nuttier since your father's death three years ago. She's more difficult now. Needy is the word that comes to mind. When he first died almost two years ago, she said it felt like a part of her body disappeared. It sounded unbearable and romantic. You imagined your mother's arm turning to ash and blowing away in the wind, mingled with your father's ashes, gray and curling like burnt paper. These days, it's more run of the mill morning, almost kitsch. Whenever you visit, she talks about your dad's spirit moving stuff around. You've read up on grief. And this is one of the documented coping mechanisms. People engage in fantasies. A griever imagines that the little frog in the garden is their dead loved one, riveting the message they most want to hear. I love you, I love you, I love you. Or else a song that happens to come on the radio is a message from the beyond. It's a way of grasping for something no longer there. Maybe you should understand this, but you don't. When your father died, there were no talking animals. There was just a sad nothingness. For your mother, it's all about spoons. Whenever she can't find the spoon, she thinks your father's father has moved them, which is frankly ridiculous. Even if ghosts existed, why would your fathers hang around the house playing stupid pranks on your mother? What could a ghost possibly get out of that? But that was your mother being ridiculous. You've always wanted her to be a bit more normal, a bit more stable. Was that too much to ask? So far, yes. On Saturday, before you start out, you call and leave her a message that you're on your way. She responds with a text. See you soon, Cherry. That's weird. Probably a spell check error, but from what? Usually she calls you honey, sweetie, or when you're edgy with her, tiger. In any case, about an hour later, you're at her door. You step just inside into the foyer and call out, mom? A voice with a French accent replies from the kitchen. Enter, chérie. And a moment later, a petite lady in a smart little outfit moves towards you. She's wearing slacks, a purple blouse, and a beautiful silk scarf wrapped elegantly around her neck and tied in the front. You thought your mother needed you when in fact she's surrounded by friends or at least a friend. You're more than annoyed. It's not like you can just take time off from your work and drive up to see your mother anytime you want. You have hours of data waiting on your desk 27 bilingual first graders chatted their little hearts out over a six month period. They created thousands of speech acts that need to be analyzed and put into categories before you can graduate from school and start the rest of your life. When you get to the kitchen, the table is set for two with your mother's oversized soup spoons, the very ones your father had hidden the last time, a basket of sliced French bread, green salad already tossed, and two water glasses. I made your favorite soup, chérie, tomato, the woman says. The chérie grates on you, but you don't say anything. You just want to see your mother already. You run upstairs, and maybe it's the running that dislodges an image from childhood, reaching up towards your mother, who's squatting down to your kid level, her pink cotton apron suspended between you. You get to her bedroom, no mother, and not the same bedroom either. The shape remains intact, but everything else has changed. Your mother has wallpapered the walls. It's a light yellow paper with green vines all through it. And there's a new bed or maybe just a new headboard with a wrought iron twisty viney pattern, which goes just perfectly 
with the paper. Since when did your mother get style? It makes you a little bit angry. You thought your mother was living out the remainder of the life she shared with your father and that she would continue and remember. She wasn't supposed to fix things up for a brand new future. Your own bedroom in your apartment back in the city has only a few posters on white walls. After seeing your mother's improvements, you realize that you're more or less living in a warehouse, a waiting area for the rest of your life. You check the bathroom, which is also newly wallpapered, though this time it's just a little strip around the top part of the walls. Absolutely lovely. And the bathtub has been replaced by one with claw feet. The bidet is still there, a weird little addition your mother put in right after your father died. You thought it was strange, but you didn't say anything considering the state she was in back then. It's a wonder your mother's had time to call you complaining with all the renovating she's been up to. Yes, it looks better, but it's no longer the exact same place where you grew up. And it feels strange, like your memories are now homeless. You glance into your old bedroom. Nothing changed there, which is a relief, but also somehow a disappointment. She spruced up her areas of the house, but she hasn't bothered with yours. The search is done. Your mother is not up there. Cherie, the woman calls out from downstairs and you head back down to the kitchen. Where's my mother, you ask her, and who are you? The woman looks at you wide-eyed as if you've caught her and she doesn't know what to say. Then she gestures to your jacket, which you've been carrying around. Oh, just put that in the closet. She points down the hallway. She seems a little frantic, and that's what tips you off that something may be seriously wrong. You imagine the worst, an accident, a heart attack. Maybe that's what your mother meant about changing, that her health had changed. You're afraid to ask, so you go down the hall and put your coat in the closet. But when you get back, you whisper, is my mother dead? The woman snorts, don't say stupid things. Stupid things? An image of your father in his coffin comes to you. He looks so small and light, almost like a child. When she sees your sad expression, the woman softens. No, Cherie, everything is fine, absolutely fine. And everything is ready, she adds, sit. You lower into a seat. You should have come sooner. You should have seen your mother. You could have helped. Snap out of it, you tell yourself. She's probably just napping. Your mother loves a good nap. It's one of her special luxuries. It's always seemed boring, but now it's endearing. Any second now, she'll step from her gorgeous bedroom, her soft face wrinkled from the pillowcase, but you went to her room. She wasn't there. Then, oddly, the woman says, oh, your father, he hide the ladle again. You always move the spoons when you come. You thought only your mother believed in ghosts who displaced spoons. Apparently this French woman shares that weirdness. The woman smiles to herself as she searches the cabinets, just as your mother has always done. And it's odd to see those familiar movements on this stranger. She looks in all the cabinets, even in the oven. This is ridiculous. Where is my mother, you demand? The woman turns to you. She hesitates, acting coy, almost flirtatious, when she points to her two shoulders and displays herself. Right here, she says. What? Your mother had high cheekbones. This woman's face is rounder. The woman, seeing your confusion, begins to laugh, and the chuckling is familiar. There's nothing of your mother's physicality in that lithe form. Your mother is thick and soft and American, this woman is slender, tiny, and French. Mom? Yes, chérie, the woman says innocently, drawing out her words. Now she's gazing at you, waiting for you to figure things out, like she used to do when you were a kid and she was helping you with your fraction homework. Mom, is it you? You squint at the woman, but you can't locate your mother's round shape in the body of this tiny chic woman. But of course comes the reply. The woman smiles. You remember, I tell you, I change. She's speaking in accented English and she looks nothing like your mother, but somehow you know it's her. Oh yes, she changed. Thank you. 
And now it's my pleasure to introduce Andrea Marcusa. Andrea's literary fiction and essays have appeared in the Gettysburg Review, River Sticks, Citron Review, Cutback, and others. She's received recognition for her writing in a range of competitions, including Glimmer Train, Southampton Review, Raleigh Review, and New Letters. You can see Andrea Marcusa online at andreamarcusa.com and on Twitter at D underscore Marcusa. Welcome, Andrea. It's really an honor to read with um, such an accomplished group of writers um, and friends. Writer Studio is like a second home to me, uh, especially during the pandemic. So thanks for being here. I'm going to read some sections from a short story called The Siege. Um, it appeared earlier this year in the Gettysburg Review. <clears throat> the people in this country tell me not to be afraid of the rebels. They tell me the rebels are miles away. Yesterday, there was a small incident, an hour's drive from here in the mountains, close to the border. But, that's, but, but I've been told that's been going off on and off for decades. I came here to be near my son three months ago, after my father passed away. My life's been emptying. My husband moved out years ago, then my son left the country. Automation killed my hospital job processing data. My friends fell away. After my last paycheck, my father gave me his basement to live in. He kept the ground floor. In return, I looked after him. Even now, months later and thousands of miles away, it still feels like yesterday that I sat with him as he held that chip coffee mug in his shaking hands and looked at me with an expression that I'd waited a lifetime to see. Some buried love had finally leaked through the cracks. After I'd paid for the funeral, there wasn't much left. I couldn't afford to stay in the house he rented, and I was too broken to look for work. My 29-year-old son, who'd flown back from North Africa for their service, was leaving soon. I could hear him in the next room packing. I was at the kitchen table adding up the column of cash from the sales of my father's beat-up Toyota, his fishing gear, his books of mediocre stamps he'd collected, along with some small savings he'd left me. It's not enough to live on, I said out loud to no one. Perhaps my son had heard me from the other room or noticed the panic on my face when he walked back into the kitchen because he said, you could be a rich woman where I live. US dollars will buy five times what they do here. Come and stay for a few weeks until you... His words surprised me. He'd always preferred his solitude. Was I to be back in his life finally after almost a decade? By week's end, I bought a ticket. When I arrived here, it was May and already so hot, the sweat ran down my legs and an intense sun burned my skin in minutes. I found a flat in an old stucco building with stone stairs and rusting railings in the city outskirts by the aquamarine sea. It was large, newly painted in pastels and had a small balcony. Through the big French doors, I looked out over the town's white rooftops and domes and the pink bourguignola blossoming to the emerald blue, feeling the sea air on my face, savoring a chorus of birds. I thought how my son was right. I could have a fine life here. My son who took odd jobs fixing computers lived in the old city in a cr crumbling neoclassical structure of one of the once grand avenues down a warren of narrow streets. He preferred it said he'd completely rid himself of bourgeois Western values. I prefer the simple life, he told me, when he saw my reaction to the cracked walls and primitive plumbing. In those first few weeks, we were together often. I would take a $2 taxi ride through the winding streets, past the bored uniformed men patrolling the downtown, the military vehicles idly parked on the square, past the hungry cats sliding along walls and pawing for scraps to its, his building. Through a portico, it was up three flights, up a narrow stairway, through his blue wooden door. I it was always amazed when he opened it and I saw my son after all these years standing there.
He took me to open air markets to show me where to buy tangerines, tomatoes, cucumbers, and eggs. And he greeted the sellers with a cheerful, assalamu alaikum, then pointed to me and said, umi. The vendors looked so pleased when they heard this. One morning, we walked 10 minutes to see Marwan, the local butcher. My son wanted me to see the man's masterful technique. He stood, we stood and watched his gleaming knife make swift cuts to a lamb, the cramped space filling with the copper penny smell of blood as it pooled on the floor. I had to look away. I could see no skill, only death. The same thing happens in the States, mom, he scolded under his breath. Only they treat the animals much worse. Outside, I spotted a bull, a young bull with gentle eyes tied to a post. I was more than ready to leave that shop when I noticed a big woman with flowing skirts and a sturdy frame waving to us from the back. My son said it was Ami, the butcher's wife. She welcomed me with great fanfare and then turned to my son and hugged him like he was her own. This greeting overwhelmed me. It felt strong and genuine. I admit I felt immediately drawn to her kindness. In fact, I felt hungry for it. And I thought my son did too. But seeing them embrace, I felt lacking. My son never hugged me like this. I'd never been a nurturer, not even with my father at the end of his life. I'd never had much to give away the way some women do. A reluctant mother, I'd had a child because I'd found myself pregnant and never decided to end it. Freshly married and estranged from my family, I was fixated on my cat of a husband. I had no plan. I felt no yearning for an infant to hold. I was staying up all night waiting for my man to come home or hiding from his drunken fists. It was only after the baby was born and I looked into her, his bright eyes that I was seduced by my child's love. Fierce and boundless, it took root, nourishing me until it vanished behind my son's scowl. We walked and talked. We ignored the soldiers, the armored vehicles. Those first few weeks, everything looked so foreign. I barely noticed how each day, more and more uniforms and guns appeared all around us. Later that same evening, I returned to his flat for a cup of tea and fell asleep on a chair. I awoke with the sun and the singing of birds and waited for my son to stir. It had been 10 years since we'd lived under one roof. In his flat, I found myself fussing about the kitchen, brewing tea. I wanted to do so much for him, make up for lost years, the times when he was small and he wanted me. Back after the marriage collapsed and I was alone, my mind often fixated on some new handsome face with an empty wallet and hungry roaming eyes. I needed my nights in strong arms so much that I left my son with his father, a man with a poisonous heart and granite knuckles. I told myself it was good for my son to have a father, to spend time with him. Somehow I convinced myself that that sliver of tenderness he'd once shown me would always be there for my son. Oh, the lies I told myself back then. When I recall those first weeks after my arrival here, I want them back. Now, after being here for three months, I feel off balance. The luminous light reflecting off the sea that lifted me when I first arrived disorients me. And there's more rumblings that wake me in the night, an occasional pop that sounds like gunfire. How worry has replaced the boredom on the faces of the young soldiers in the square. Last week, barricade, barricades appeared up and down the Grand Avenues. And then there's the knife I found while I was making my son's bed. I was just straightening the blade almost the length of my forearm was old and worn, but the edge was newly honed and there were Arabic words engraved on its handle. I couldn't imagine what my son would use it for. There seems little reason to have a knife in the city. He's no outdoorsman who needs to cut a fishing line and fillet his catch. My son is not a collector. The only thing he things he needs are the ones that he needs to live day to day. I copied the Arabic letters onto a piece of paper to translate them for, ever, for later, then tucked the knife back under the pillows. I haven't mentioned the knife or its inscription. The wound, wound that bleedeth inwardly is the most dangerous. In September, I walk with my son along the corniche near my flat. A thick mist hugs the shore, even though it's nearly noon. When are you going back to California? 
he asks. I'm still settling in, still enjoying how far one dollar can go, still happy to be away from everything I've lost back home. I smile, put my arm on his back and say, I don't know, I thought I'd stay a while longer. A coldness spreads over him and he pulls away from me. A few minutes later, he's gone. In November, blue skies give way to gray and my son starts canceling. He phones less and less. When I call him, he cuts me short. I'm afraid to ask why, afraid he'll tell me to leave, that he never should have suggested that I move here. Each morning, I awake to rain pelting on my balcony. But when I look out and see the roofs slick with wet, hear the children's voices in the street, and realize I'm here, I smile. In such a short time, I've grown linked to this rundown place with its drafty rooms, laundry flapping on lines, and the smell of wood fires burning for heat. I think of mornings in California when the fall rains come. <clears throat> Nothing but gray and identical driveways, freeways, shopping centers. I'm not going back to California. All that's left for me there are memories. I pick up the phone to call my son, but stop myself. Later that week, he calls and says he's taken a teaching job. Teaching, I ask, English? the boy who almost was held back in seventh, seventh grade because of his failing English grade? Yes, in the Casbah. Even I, a recent expat, knows the Casbah is infested with rebels. Why the Casbah? The rebels are there. Isn't that dangerous? Don't speak of things you know nothing about. I'm not blind, I say. There are tanks, guns. Things feel tense everywhere. I wait through a long pause. It's always been this way, he says. If you don't feel comfortable, you should go home. I have to go, he says and hangs up. I know what I see, I know what I feel. I don't know why I can't get him to understand. And his new job, my son, a teacher, he doesn't even like people. As the days continue, I find myself passing the butcher shop more and more. When she is there, Amy, Amy run, hurries to the front door and greets me. I find ways to keep our conversation going in my clumsy Arabic. Ami practices her terrible English. We laugh a lot, trying to understand each other. If the store is not crowded, she invites me in for a cup of tea. When this happens, it feels like my heart feels with, fills with something like hope. The first time she invited me in, Marwan spoke to her in a harsh tone. He looked angry. I couldn't understand what he said, but I knew he didn't want me there. I couldn't see why. The store was spotless. There was no work that needed to be done, and Ami seemed eager to have me there. I had been so alone as a foreigner, and sitting with Ami in the far back of her shop, tasting her sweet mint tea, I felt happy. She dropped pine notes, nuts into the tea, and they floated on the top like tiny life rafts. She piled a tin plate with dense pastries filled with dates and pushed them towards me. I stuffed myself. I told her many stories that day about my beast of an ex-husband, about my father, how he first dimmed and then faded, went gaunt, turned the color of ash and in human shade, how during those last days, I wanted his tiny ember of life to keep burning forever and then nothing, such silence. As this story tumbled from me, my tears spilled along with it. Ami cried the moment she saw them. I'm not sure how much she understood but never in my life have I shared such a moment with someone. As we dabbed our tears, we began to laugh. Soon we were outside heading to her favorite women's clothing shop where I bought long skirts and colorful shawls. As we walked, she held my arm with her sturdy strength. I clasped hers and leaned into her hold. One morning, right after the new year, my phone rings. Are you watching the news? I tell my son, no. Turn it on. I switch on the television. There on the small screen are security vehicles, locals in a panic. There, is a huge, there was a huge gunfight in the city's northern outskirts. A truck with rebels ran a checkpoint. I stare at the images and see bodies lifted into the backs of ambulances. They're saying people living on the northeastern and northwestern perimeter should be extra careful. That's you, mom. I tell him I'm always cautious. If you were cautious, you would have left this place already. Only go out in the morning. Don't go out past noon. I heard you, I said finally. 
Why are you telling me the same thing again and again? Just listen to me, mom. I don't want you to get hurt. When will I see you? Not now, soon. With this call, hearing his concern, his worry, his absences are forgiven. In February, 15 minutes walk away, a spray of gunfire from two motorcyclists kills a government official in front of his home. Soon afterward, rebels are rounded up and imprisoned. Despite this, I am still afraid. I spend afternoons and evenings on my couch, watching world news and scrolling the internet. Every day I wake up to the same yellow walls in my bedroom, the same crooked ceiling, the same few hours of freedom to come and go. Ami says the rebels aren't terribly strong. They've never hurt locals, only the powerful. They fight the government and military, the corrupt, the ruling class, the ones driving fancy cars, the ones who shop in the handful of stores that look like they belong in a California mall. Don't worry, she laughs. You wear long skirts. You drape a scarf over your head. You look like one of us. But still, I wonder. I'm a foreigner. No matter how tanned I get, my skin is still reddish brown, my eyes pale gray. Hardly a week passes without more death. When I call my son, he says, it's human to feel vulnerable to threats. It's how the mind reacts. Control your mind and control your fear or rethink being here and go home. I have always heard that when people are oppressed, they draw together. Certainly this is true for Ami and me. Every day now I ignore my son's advice. Instead, I hold my breath and hurry down the back alleyways to Ami's storefront. My heart pounds as I travel the empty streets. Ami and I are always happy to see each other. Marwan manages a grunt hello, but I know he is suspicious and worried. The rebels are hurting his business. When I settle down to tea with Ami, something quiets in me. Just being there and hearing her deep voice, rich laugh. But today things feel off. I look at Ami and all the muscles in her face are tight. I am afraid to ask. She stands before the heating kettle. The minutes tick by. She looks over at me. I see your son, she says, leaving the casbah. He with very bad people, no good. I don't understand, my son? She pulls her chair to the table, leans over and whispers. I go to visit my cousin. She lived nearby Casbah. I see your son. He with very dangerous men. I look at her surprised. He's a teacher. Perhaps he's with one of his students, I say. She looks incredible, incredulous. These no students, these bad men. Then she frowns, stirs her tea and mutters to herself. I don't know what to say. I sit there watching Ami across from me frowning. I chat about the weather, try to make her laugh, but her frown is frozen. Her mood, her mood is sour. Our visit ends. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Liz Kingsley. Liz Kingsley is delighted to be reading with some of her favorite writers and grateful to everyone tuning in tonight. Her poetry has appeared in New Ohio Review, The McNeese Review, The Round, Euphony, Exit 13, and Tipping the Scales, and her fiction in The William and Mary Review. Love to Gretchen, Emma, Alex, Henry, Derek, Will, Dexter, Cooper, and Lily. Welcome, Liz. Thanks everyone for being here. Philanthropy. The guy who flashed me was hot. I had noticed his tight navy suit as he walked the subway platform. When I first saw the whites of his eyes, I thought maybe we could be something. When he introduced his penis, I figured he saw something in me too. Kind of like the man who pumps gas at my Sunoco. With each groan of, cash or credit, I wonder if anyone touches him. I hate the thought of ending his long days in that tiny glass booth with only Netflix and a French bread pizza. I started tipping him for wiping down my windshield and complimenting his knit hat. That's when I got the idea. I don't have typical charity currency, money or an inclination to make sandwiches, 
What I do have are fingers, agility. I went back to Sunoco with an empty tank, deflated front tires, and no antifreeze. There was so much I needed. When I rolled down my window, my friend sauntered over in his plaid flannel and head down, eked out his usual question. Before I gave him my visa, I asked to see his hands. He was hesitant, but humored me by holding out 10 callous digits. I gently massaged each of his hardened fingers, feeling its contours, the knuckles, the cuticles, the nails ridges, as if it were a newborn. He kept his eyes squarely on our interlaced fingers, confirming in my mind that whatever awaits him at home, another person's flesh is not involved. The SUV behind me leaned on its horn. I hadn't even seen it pull up. And my friend, worried about his job, no doubt, abruptly pulled away, ran back to the SUV and mumbled, cash or credit. I smelled the gas, his fingers left on mine and drove away. I want to be a Baptist for Dr. Derek E. Nelson, Sharonda, and Morgan. Walking into church with my shoulders hunched forward, I had no idea what to expect, was just acutely aware of my whiteness, but the benches in the round welcomed me to the two-hour funeral. I don't think my Jews would know how to spend that kind of time on goodbye, only on atoning. I couldn't stop looking at the large, stunning woman in the multicolored dress singing in the gallery, but that wasn't the moment I knew. I was rapt listening to the reverend preach with increasing velocity that the good doctor, just an acquaintance of mine, had been called home because his job here was done. But that wasn't quite the moment either. It was something so subtle I almost missed it. So organic, spontaneous, unabashed, and maybe this kind of thing happens at St. John's Baptist Church all the time, but nowhere I've ever seen. The woman who was due to marry the good doctor, my acquaintance, in just a few weeks, stood near his open casket, the only person on her feet. And while she sang Jesus Loves Me with the large, stunning woman in the multicolored dress, as though they were the only two people here or anywhere, she raised her arms straight up in grief, in prayer, undaunted by our hundreds of eyes, her despair so great, I imagined she was pleading that he take her too. While my shoulders stayed bent, my arms folded, my grieving him unsung, I had buried a marriage too. I stared, astonished and ready to convert. Mistake. An impromptu game of telephone, our four boys, one friend and two girlfriends. The kitchen reverberating with purposely botched whispers. When for a laugh, they call each other women, call each other gay, momentarily oblivious to the fact that we are both. Two years we've owned this house, which is only now being used as we imagined. Our children, their people and us, eating steak, potatoes, and zucchini. No one rushing out or bowing to a phone. Just high-fiving and giggling as they lovingly mock one another. Hours after turning on the packed dishwasher and wiping up the mess, we lie down. And for the second time in as many days, she asks me if we are a mistake. Not if we've made a mistake, but if in our we-ness, we are one. Truth is, harmonious nights like this are anomalous. When she first asked me this question yesterday, I was flattened with fear and dejection. But tonight, our boy's goofiness seeping into the sheetrock, injecting me with hope. I say, I have no idea, maybe we are. Kiss her shoulder and promptly fall asleep. Outside. My father sits in the corner of the pullout couch in his new rental, a studio apartment at the Colony House, a dirty beige high rise, two miles away where a lot of divorced drunks live. His legs are outstretched with his ankles crossed on the wooden coffee table, 
the only other piece of furniture he has. No one to talk to, he holds a crossword puzzle and a black felt tip pen. He sips brandy. In the kitchenette's mini fridge are four cans of ginger ale, a brick of Swiss cheese and a Mounds bar. On the counter, rye crisps and two bottles of Calvados. He fills the empty room with sounds of himself singing M-A-N with muddy waters while clicking his fingernails as he arrogantly completes the puzzle in ink, all caps. He looks out his third floor window, framed by the landlord's dusty, uneven blinds onto the parking lot. He wants to move home. He wants trees. He wants to remarry his ex-wife. He wants his family back. What he has are his blue CDs and his mystery novels in respective alphabetical piles on the floor. Driving by his former house at night, he idles near the driveway and thinks about hiking in Maine with his girls, so little when they pose for pictures at Scudic in matching purple hats crocheted by their mom. He thinks about the sexy red dress with the low, low back she wore on her 30th birthday. How proud he was when she outscored him on the law school entrance exam. He remembers a letter he wrote promising her he'd give up drinking, control his temper. He parks outside our house. I turn my bedroom light on and off so he knows I know he's there. Right. <clears throat> we are going to make it, right? She asks me this distressing question while I'm passed out late at night. Insecurity at its height, I say it plainly with intention. We're going to make it, right? The question morphs into a fight. I say, I'm sorry, I'm pretending. We're going to make it, right? We're disconnected, so I might sleep elsewhere, my form of aggression. I am going to make it right. I miss her. Maybe I will write a hopeful plea full of suggestions, intimacies to make us right. Return to bed and hold her tight. Start fresh, enact a reinvention. Desperate to be with her despite our misgivings. Though flawed, we're right. Motherhood. Motherhood, I turned 30 and handed you my life. Motherhood, my pots and pans, my sheets. I am nauseous with my own inadequacy. Where's your fucking manual? You are not a shed to be built. Motherhood, when will you be my ally? When will all your books bear fruit? I thought you loved your subjects who pray in your temple. You did not infuse me with appropriate empathy. You did not prevent my faulty decisions. Where is the instinct you promised? He has forsaken me. You didn't train me for this. You didn't tell me this could happen. Where is your contingency plan? You have betrayed your faithful. Beg as you might, I will not exonerate you. I will scrub you off my skin. I will dig up your roots in my garden. I will deny ever having known you. Motherhood, come back. Motherhood, your heart beats in me. I don't recognize my own voice. I am exhausted. Motherhood, you duped me. Fix what you have broken. I drink vodka every night. When will you convene the board? When will you give reparations? I walk the halls with one limb missing. And this is gonna be my last poem. Why I have 49 sides. Because I gallop bareback on Central Avenue. Because nausea is a man putting his tongue inside a woman's nostril because I want to preside like a 300 year old oak, because my Yunagi sashimi calls for wasabi, because my sons smell like rain from the same spring drizzle, because I feel unworthy of talking to a bride at her wedding, because theme songs break my heart, because the trumpet lies dusty in its velvet lined case, because a dog can maul as easily as it can love, because the body at all ages craves a tight swaddle. Because good God, a girl loses an ovary. Because I envy the boldness of magic markers. 
because I sleep through purring, but not snoring, because I love to earnestly write a split infinitive, because my grandmother wouldn't let me see her naked, because the rash keeps coming back, because my daughter is a non-binary gingerbreaded human, because someone else chops the peppers, the broccoli, the mushrooms, because an underhand pitch has power, because I am Stevie Nicks, because vultures are elegant, because tonight is a Jackson Pollock canvas, because holding a knife presents possibilities, because I order myself a whole pie, because a woman's eyes mourn the withdrawal of her child, because in ninth grade when and I asked P why he didn't like me, he said I was too critical. Because my armpits smell like coconut. Because my daughter is an affectionate black silk cat who attacks me. Because I dream an iambic pentameter and alliterate when I'm awake. Because I see myself in stories of drug dealers turned rappers. Because my wife's neck is a lemon cookie because the robin flits among branches with a plastic wrapper in its mouth, because my love is stronger than the universe, because I'm the first one with my coat on, because every emoji's expression looks the same, because I can't do a split, because I'm afraid of butter, because I'll always be 14, because I read eight books at once, because I take small bites, because heat, because I relish a perfect square. Because my pregnant belly was public property. Because Levon Helm kneeled down to meet my boys. Because my name is chronically misspelled. Because self-deprivation is its own intoxication. Because I remember when a hashtag was a number sign. Because I will leave here and do a row of cartwheels. Because 49 reasons all in a line, all of them good ones all of them lies. Thank you. Joel Hinman is the director of the New York and Hudson Valley programs at the Writers Studio where he teaches level two classes. He has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and his fiction has appeared in Epiphany, Brooklyn Review, the Alabama Literary Review and Confrontation, among others. He is currently working on a novel and a collection of short stories. I give you the mastermind and the master heart behind this reading, Joel Hinman. Amazing work from my fellow readers, from Sean and Sylvie, Jen, Andrea, Liz. Wow, very inspirational. Thank you all. All right, I'm gonna change my face here and get ready to read, go from host to reading. Assisted Living, Yelp Reviews, Spring River House, Spring River, Indiana. We post with hope, we post we post this with hope and gratitude for the staff of Spring River, who realize, unlike so many others, that the elderly under their supervision suffer from a perpetual and irreversible condition. A morbid byproduct of our advanced age is that we have no skin left. What once protected us is gone, abraded, chafed, or worn away, sloughed off. For years, we were housed, billeted, and parked in facilities which ignored our infirmity. What covers us now is thin as frost, as brittle as rice paper. We are abject, yet abiding. Here, the inconsequential meets the insubstantial, and lately, we have noted that we have become translucent. Our innards are revealed, rib cage and cartilage, rope and pulley. We are spokes without the wheel. Inspected by strangers, we tremble like wind chimes. It wasn't until we were remanded to Spring River that we found relief from our condition. They alone knew to turn us over, to soothe our dry patches with cooling aloe, to slather us with liniment and salve and creams until we were gleaming jellyfish. 
but whatever you think, we ask you not to be moved to pity. In this here and now, we prepare for our transfiguration. This is the stage that precedes transcendence. Reductions are necessary. Another world beckons. We await our rebirth as spirit. Yellow Sky Acres, Bangles, Oklahoma. I gave these guys one star, which I'm told is the least amount you can give someone and still have your answer recorded. It's supposed to be the worst rating, but still, I have to say, it feels unsatisfying. Bella Vista Manor, Bella Vista, Arkansas. Mom couldn't be happier in this spick and span, humanely organized memory care facility. The food is good and plentiful, the staff cheerful and attentive. There's an up with people vibe to the decor where floral patterns abound and volume lighting brightens dark corners. The blend of ranch and Tyrolean styles reminded Jeff and I of Australia. Peaceful Pines, Reliance, Pennsylvania. I know how I'm going to die on hold with an insurance company or maybe scrambling across the floor of an examination room in an ass vented smarta while a creature in a hazmat suit chases me with an instrument plucked off Torquemada's dressing table. Sunrise Senior Care, Durango, Colorado. They brought dad out on the lawn in a kind of rolling cage. It looked like they had pieced it together from parts of a jungle gym. It was red, I remember that much. The orderly held dad by his belt loops to keep him from tipping forward. They had dad in one of those transparent face shields and he was wearing what I think they call a disposable bouffant cap. On top of that, they draped the front of the cage in an enormous plastic sleeve. And I was wearing protective gear but I swear even with all that, I could feel the heat in his hands. I just couldn't look him in the eye. Silverado Senior Care, Middletown, Idaho. This nearly destroyed me. It is a well-known fact that tearing someone with Lewy body dementia from their familiar surroundings is pretty detrimental. It accelerates the mental and physical decline, but I had no choice. She could not remain at home. So I did what I always do when faced with a crisis. I researched. I did a deep dive into ALFs and CCRCs. I checked out skilled nursing and notice how the words palliative care now just roll off my tongue. However, in the process, I discovered the blog dignifiedendings.net, which led me to Silverado Senior Care. And what distinguishes Silverado is their adherence to validation theory which from what I can tell represents the new frontier in memory care. Validation theory rejects the chauvinistic practice of imposing our reality on our seniors. It means we go to where they are rather than demand that they come to us. I mean, why do we always insist they know what day it is or what the story of Thanksgiving is? Who cares if mom thinks she's at Woodstock with Santana's drummer? I could think of worse things. Let's honor their reality for a change because I think about now we would have figured out how horrible things get when we command others to agree to our beliefs. And I've seen enough of what people pass off as their realities to say it doesn't look like something we should be imposing on anyone. Know what I'm saying? What about mom? She's doing okay, not great, but a lot better than she would be if she wasn't at Silverado. If you haven't faced this, you wouldn't know. The Living Well Plantation, Charleston, South Carolina. What's in a name? This immaculate facility has received four Chamber of Commerce badges and it is no wonder. Refreshing vegetation dots the well-cut paths through the solarium and the well-stocked library features all the latest holiday magazines. Everyone seemed quiet and content. The teenage server brought the food out while it was still hot and the Chablis paired well with the fish. Canterbury Long-Term Care, Canterbury, Virginia. We visited my aunt in this facility and it was too loud. Since COVID, they play bingo in their doorways, but why can't the bingo caller turn down the volume? Signed, a devoted nephew. Sunset by the Bay, Palm Bay, Florida. I'm calling a lawyer. 
Sunset needs to start paying a living wage. My mom told me some poor woman was stuck in one Salem witch dunking chair for half an hour with her feet immersed in 60 degree temperature water while Darnell, while Darnell argued with his baby mama about the diaper money. Mom says everyone likes Darnell, but all they could do was sit there feeling ashamed while this played out. The other day I was at the front desk and I could hear one of the orderlies back in the office trying to beg cheese out of the dingbats at effing E-F-A-H-A-P. And I know spam when I taste it. Rosegate Village Wellness Center, Templeton, Kansas. I told the wife you can drop me off here anytime. Went to visit Aunt Sally and discovered this facility is dedicated to making one's final years as fun as possible. They built this outdoor amusement village that has all these paved bike paths so the seniors can tool around on tricycles and visit their interactive storefronts. They got ice cream parlors, hairdressers, even an old fashioned horseshoe pitch. We hear they never play any music later than Elvis. And what was that smell? Was someone lurking in the bushes with an atomizer misting the air with per peppermint perfume? The day we visited, flags were flying and banners were snapping in the breeze, and everybody seemed giddy with happiness. Female staff dressed up like candy stripers with these Nixon era bouffant hairdos, circulated trays of lemonade and pills for those who need to be reminded to take their meds. Me and the wife stopped off at the Bahama Mama Shack where our aunt treated us to some delicious Instagram worthy mocktails. No more doing laundry or having to cook meals? Give me a break. I'll start now. Meadowlark Hills, Windsor Locks, Connecticut. Meadowlarks, more like vultures. Every morning, Monday morning, you can hear Oprah Group and Fuhrer Donahue coming down the hall asking if there are any beds, meaning who croaked over the weekend. I've had it up to here with medical euphemisms. Agony is agony, not discomfort. Donahue, who comes out of Cornell's hotel motel management, apparently has adapted open table software to senior occupancy, arranging for the overflowing state hospitals to act as feeder facilities. You should see her back there with her whiteboard, happy as a pig in, well, you know. Just before dawn, you can hear the gurneys clicking along the corridor, toes tagged for the mortician, horsemen pass by. St. Francis Residential, Applejack, Wisconsin. You're not gonna find this in the newsletter, but we recently had an outbreak of chlamydia. And from what I'm told, every college level gerontology studies program includes a class on STDs. Not only is this a very strong instinct, but apparently it doesn't go away or diminish with age. Story is Jason from the kitchen went to Canada and brought back some black market blue pills. But things got pretty lively with a lot of bed hopping. But the problem is that contact tracing is very complicated when you're dealing with memory impairment. Rufus, the EMT, was a bit of a wiseacre, asked if we were running a hot sheet hospice. Very funny, Rufus. Bella Vista Triage Center, Bella Vista, Arkansas. On mom's certificate, the cause was listed as failure to thrive which I have since learned is the description used when you die of isolation and loneliness. Mom was not autistic. She was just very, very direct. For 42 years, she was the absolute boss in her house and she just couldn't adjust to the idea that in her so-called new home, all the rules were made by someone else, some lawyer at some distant corporate headquarters. I tried to tell the folks at Bella Vista that we had to find a way to avoid provoking her since she's so territorial. But after she busted the window during the closed window visit, they took away some of her privileges. It was all downhill. I'm not blaming anyone. This is all on COVID. My husband says he keeps thinking about that line from Cool Hand Luke. What we have here is a failure to communicate. But I think failure to thrive pretty much describes what this country went through over the last year. Mom will never forget. Denholm, a resilient senior community, Denholm, Oregon. My wife and I took a tour and were blown away. 
Misty Swallowtail, the director of Medicine Arrival, and told us to think of Denholm as a gymnasium for the mind. She explained how when you age, your short-term or working memory decreases, but your long-term memory gets sharper. Working with a team of professionally trained hypnotists and psychologists who specialize in geriatric care, they devised their trademark program called Memory Adventure, a series of visualization meditations that allow seniors to return to the glory days of youth. In 45-minute classes, you can revisit Ms. Turo's third grade social science class where the adventure leader uses precise and specific details like the knob of gum under the desk to make it feel real. Today, we visit the ladies who are off visiting Paris during haute couture. And down in the man cave, Barry Unsworth had taken the men back to the Mekong. You could hear him through the wall shouting, don't shoot, that's a water buffalo. Misty said the memory adventures really support the sense of shared community, which has been particularly important during the pandemic. Next month, the whole place is taking a trip to Vegas. I think we have a shot at winning, Misty laughed. Doesn't get better than that. The Healthy Place Memory Care, Jennifer Springs, Indiana. COVID or not, no one should have to go through what my family did. Last Sunday, we gathered in the den for our weekly FaceTime visit, but what appeared on the screen was scarcely human. Apparently, Templeton had dismissed their barber as non-essential, and Dad somehow got his hands on an electric razor. He'd hacked off clumps of hair. There were open spots where he'd shaved down to the stubble, but other places where the scalp was cut, and you could see the thin lines of blood drying. One hank on the left side stood straight up and fell across the side of his face, covering his left eye but it was the look in his eye that frightened me. And I made Sally take the kids out of the room. I didn't want them seeing people like this. The one eye staring back at me wasn't filled with rage or betrayal. At the back of the eye, there was hatred, something I'd never seen before. Hatred for me, for everyone who'd reduced him to this condition. Even I believe for my mother who abandoned him by dying before him. I tried to tell him I would come in person, but of course, right now, no visitors. Sony Senior Center, Sony, Georgia. Is anybody coming to get us? We've only got the Filipino woman. I can't remember what my son told me about this thing. Isn't this where you call for help? Thank you.